This, this will be a challenge, speaking slowly for me. <laughs> I don't think I've done anything in my life slowly. <laughs> Just to review the fundamentals of how, what happens in, in ballpark times of when things will occur. So in many cases, late April, early May is bud break. Generally by the end of August, we hope that that shoot that started from that bud has begun to slow down. You may have lateral growth, but you're hoping that that primary shoot has started to slow down. So you have a really big period of active growth, new leaves, expansion of leaves, for roughly about 120 days. But the leaves themselves that start and grow first are not your best leaves at the end of the year because they're old. So it's taking that into account. Leaf fall when frost occurs. From that point, basically when active growth stops, the plant is storing energy for the following year. But it's also, and this will lead into Jim's talk today about winter hardiness and cold survival, it has to accumulate enough reserves to protect the buds through the winter and grow the following year. If we look on the fruit side, which is where we make money, bloom, fruit set, somewhere during late June, early July. Veraison occurring generally for us begins in first part of August to mid-August and onwards. And your maturation through September, October, and hopefully before frost. This is basically your reproductive, so the flowering part. The key part is to remember that the initiation of flowers for the following year occurs from the end of fruit set through to just before veraison. Sunlight interception on the wood and the buds is critical during that period to get the buds you want to keep for the following year fruitful, so they will flower. If they are shaded excessively, they will often be non-fruitful and give you vegetative growth with no clusters, which again, we don't make money out of. So if we look at it, we go, here's the most rapid period of growth of shoots. And by this, what I've got, and, and I didn't put anything on the, the Y scale because it's, it's more of a trend, because if I put units on it, people want to know exactly what was measured. But there is a period where shoots grow very, very quickly in the first roughly 20 days after bud break. There's a rapid growth, and the rate of growth, it doesn't mean they get smaller, but the rate at which they grow declines up to about 120 days, and then it tails right off. You may have lateral growth, but that original bud will only grow for roughly 120 days. Roots, on the other hand, are active at a different period. We know from bud break that roots are not actively growing. At bud break, the plant is growing because of all the carbohydrate it's stored in its roots and in the trunk and in the canes from the previous year. It's stored energy. This is very important when you think of fertilization. People think they should fertilize early so the roots will grab it and help the plant grow quickly. Those roots are not very active. The roots are active roughly about 40 days after bud break is when their most active period of growth is and uptake. If we look at the trunk, the trunk actually grows. It has to get bigger every year. And it doesn't start until about 30 days after bud break and it will slowly expand. And then roughly at about 60 days or about the middle of stage two berry growth, it peaks and then it will decline over time. There's a slight increase late in the season because that is when the leaves are partitioning more if there's no fruit available and trying to put a little bit more into the storage organ, but it will gain some more. The berries, this is the classic berry graph showing that there's a period of rapid growth, then basically it sits as it switches, and then it resumes growth again after veraison, but it declines quickly. And by that I mean 
there's sugar accumulation, but the berry size does not grow dramatically. Shortly after veraison, the berries are very close to 75 to 80 percent of their final weight and size in terms. All the cells, as big as it can get, is pretty much set. But there's a, the later accumulation, the growth of the berry, and the increase in weight is carbohydrates going in. And then if you get a late rain, you'll get a swell of water in them, but in most cases. So it's, it's two different phases where it wants to grow, then it sits, then it grows, then it sits. This one, when I use with the students, this is one I've put on an exam for them. <laughs> but I don't, and I say label each one of those lines. <laughs> because it is very complicated, what's going on in the grapevine. But in fact, it does make sense. Your roots are very active. An interesting part that I found was, here was, was root development. If you read the literature, and go to other hemispheres, uh, even in California and even in, in South Africa, they will show a huge development of roots late in the season. But that's because it never freezes. <laughs> it gets cooler, so they have this late growth with leaves present but no fruit present, so the plant can accumulate more. We don't find that, and at least I've never found that in, in any of the information around here, uh, New York, uh, Virginia, but, but definitely warmer areas, they do have a little bit. Provided that there weren't too many leaves or too thick of growth around the buds. You don't need absolute full sunlight to initiate, um, to get bud initiation, but you want intensity of light for a small period of time over a number of days. And in most cases, if you have reasonable weather from fruit set, even with, it's a, it's a, this window here, between, really between fruit set and veraison, you have six weeks to get sunlight. So it's not as if it's seven days. There's a long period. What can be encouraged sometimes if you think you're in the middle of that kind of thing is to look at, that's where they often will do, uh, people will go in and remove blind shoots, non-fruitful shoots near the fruitful ones so that it will allow more sunlight inside and get more initiation for the following year. So the fact it was a gray year does not mean you won't have fruit, but you have to manage and be prepared. Generally after very bright years, you actually have too much fruit. <laughs> But on a dull year, you might just have a balanced amount for the following year. It's also influenced by the crop level. If you have a very, very heavy crop one year, the plant will, it will flower the following year, but often clusters will be smaller. And that's often, we don't see let fewer clusters, but we may see, flowers, <laughs> may see clusters with fewer flowers. It won't actually, leaf removal at harvest will not impact at flowering. at flowering, but leaf removal, and there has been work done on that in an attempt to actually make clusters longer. Oh, yeah. So there, there's less rot in other ones. They've been doing work on it. There has been no impact that they have found on that year's fruit quality or the volume of harvest. You can do that. It slows the rate of growth a bit, but it will not impact on harvest. And, and really what these slides are showing is that the plant has energy demand, but it's different parts of the plant at different times. First the shoots, then the roots, then the flowers, the trunk, the berry sizes. So it just, where it's going to focus its energy. That's really what I'm trying to get across here. It's just, if you see it, it's, it's fairly consistent. The plant ha uses energy all the way through, but it's a different part of the plant that gets where the energy is focused. And the rate of growth is highest early because this is all stored energy. From this point onwards, this is energy that the leaves are producing for the plant. But they have to keep themselves alive as well as feeding the plant. So that's why it's at a lower magnitude or lower rate.
That's all we're trying to do. <laughs> Capture sunlight, take some carbon dioxide, add some water to create carbohydrate. So, from bud break through to four leaves, all of the energy comes from the plant towards the tip. These leaves are not sending anything back to the plant. At the fifth leaf, we now have, this was the very first leaf that came out. It's mature. It's going to send some to the tip, but it will also start sending some back to the roots. When the leaves are yellow, that means they're just feeding themselves. They're not adding to the plant. When they're dark green, means that they're producing energy that will feed these leaves as well as feed the rest of the plant. So for the rest of the slides, that's how I've split them out. But at this point, new root development is going so that it needs energy from the plant because stored energy from the roots area has been going up to the shoots, but there's extra energy needed to keep the, get these new roots to develop and grow. Every year we have to grow new roots. If we don't, the plant will die. It has to grow new roots and new root hairs. At bloom, there is a lot of root activity at the same time. But again, you have a larger number of leaves going backwards with only a few leaves demanding at the tip. And generally at bloom, you will not see through the bloom period any new leaves develop. The plant will focus all of its energy on flowering and fruit set. It's People look at me at times and say, but it's true. If you look at that shoot and it's flowering, no new leaves show up until it's finished flowering. <laughs> at fruit set, what happens in shortly afterwards is that the distance from your leaf at the, at the tip to where your clusters are, there's less hormone suppression of lateral buds. And your first lateral shoots will start to appear. Okay? The breaking of these buds is all dependent on the distance from a growing tip. So the energy that's coming down is not only going to the roots, but now it's starting to deflect energy into the fruit for the first phase of growth and expansion of the berries. So what happens when we hedge? Well, when I cut the tip off, my analogy is like having a prison and you get rid of the warden and let the inmates take over. All the prisoners get to do what they want. And that's what happens. When you take that hormone source at the tip away, laterals will break. And they start to grow because they're no longer under influence of the tip. So as these grow, as these leaves mature, they feed back. These ones out here are just taking in a little bit of energy to expand. This is why late in the season, I don't mind seeing a lot of these develop at the top because they are helping my fruit. And as we talked the other day, often all of the leaves very close to the fruit really are not adding any more to the system. They stay alive, but they're not really adding back in. So that's why in many cases we can remove those leaves without any harm to the plant. No, it, we will often do it uh, pre raison but we'll often do it on the morning side of the plant for whites. For reds, we'll actually remove on both sides of the plants without any negative. You want to do the leaf removal slightly earlier so we don't burn the berries, get sunburn. But no, that's, it, it works.
No, these, there are a large number of leaves on the lateral that are actually feeding. They are more than 30 days of age. The, the net demand of this whole shoot, the demand of these leaves is less than the total amount produced by that shoot to send back. When you get close to harvest, I want as much as I can of everything to go back to my fruit in that last 30 days. I really don't want very many of these. That's why we don't cut them off, because if I cut them again, more laterals will break. Most cases, those leaves' primary role is shading to help protect the fruit from burn. It's not a negative on the plant. What they are, they are photosynthesizing enough to keep themselves alive. So in other words, they feed themselves. They're not taking food from the plant. No, leaf removal is, the key is to understand that leaf removal is not a negative. And we often do it to allow for better spray penetration, more sunlight interception on the fruit. In, in where, it's, where it has potentially been a negative is on a drought year because those leaves are still using water, right? Because they have to feed themselves. So they have to take water in, collect sunlight, and use it to make carbohydrate, and then they respire it quickly. Exactly. Exactly. In a normal year, in an, if you are very good at pest control yeah. and everything else, you don't have to do leaf removal. Yeah. But I would say, I've yet to see that. <laughs> <laughs> in Ontario, we have to remove the leaves because yeah. we cannot get enough spray in this area to protect the fruit from mildew, mm -hmm. from botrytis, from berry moth, Anything that's very specific to the fruit, it's very hard to spray the entire cluster if there's a leaf anywhere near it. We start shortly after fruit set. Okay. Because we have to cover part of the reason, two, two, um, two serious problems that we have in Ontario. One is powdery mildew. The other one is great berry moth. And mildew, it, the cluster is very sensitive to powdery mildew for six weeks, from fruit set literally to veraison. You can get berry infection. So if you can't get your spray on the berries, you're going to have problems. And we have had that years. So we go very aggressively to remove the leaves so we get better spray coverage of our, of our fruit clusters. That's a, a, a huge part of why we do it. And we like the sunlight on the red varieties for color late in the season. That's right. In many cases, we try to get away with one leaf removal. But if it's a wet year with a lot of regrowth, we may have to go back. But I would say most years, you only have to do that zone once. Okay. And on hybrids, it's not as critical as if you get into vinifera. Yeah. Because hybrids have big internodes. Yeah. So the space between the leaves allows more things. But when you get vinifera with tiny, you have leaves crunched all over top each other. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's, it's part of the... We like the leaf removal. We've, we've moved from late leaf removal, which I call it veraison, to more and earlier and earlier, and then let the plant reestablish. In, in that case, like Vidal, it's, it's one or two leaves. It's not yeah. 
don't strip them. Okay? It's, it's, we have some growers that, believe it or not, they take all the leaves off and six leaves above the fruit. It is, it, it, uh, it's, yeah, Jim knows. It's, when you look at it, you just go like this, you go crazy. It's, but with Vidal, one or two leaves, just enough to open it to recognizing you're not going to impact, but yes, you still need to have protection. We have had very good success. We have uh, four or five different machines. The one that's done the best work for us so far is actually an air shear machine rather than a physical uh, machine. It actually ha has an air stream that spins, but they've gotten very good at setting the distance so you don't damage the cluster. And what it often does is just cut the blade off and leaves, <laughs> leaves the PDO behind. And that's okay. There's no problem with disease, no problem with anything else, but it's removed that shading spot. And it has worked. Some do, yes. But in many cases for the hybrids or if they had to do that, they'll, uh, they won't do a hand follow-up. It's not, they don't see the benefit. And I, I can say I haven't seen it. There's not a lot of leaf removal on hybrids for us, but only where there's been problems in the past with diseases. They say, okay, we will go through and remove them. But in many cases, hybrids really generally don't require the leaf removal. They're inherently, they're a little bit better uh, for disease resistance. And again, because there's distance between the nodes, your spray can get in. Most, a good sprayer can manage it. This one, what this is saying during fruit ripening, it's the leaves above the fruit clusters that feed the cluster. When I've done this for some people, they think that leaves on another part of the plant are going to translocate over and feed that cluster. They don't do that. It feeds its own. <laughs> so that is why uh, a, a shoot with clusters, if it has laterals, I'm happy. Because that's more leaves feeding that fruit cluster. Only if they're shading, if they're creating problems. Yeah, they want to, you want to do it as few times through traveling as possible. Mm -hmm. This is just showing light, the fact that how much light we get in photosynthetic activity. The part to remember is that we only need one third of full sunlight for the leaf to be at 100%. Where this comes into play is what I was talking about yesterday was refraction or bouncing of light or light getting through. As it moves through the leaf layers, well, after harvest, yeah, and then the bulk of post-harvest or once the fruit's gone is to feed the, the storage for the following year. A critical thing to remember is through from veraison to harvest, 50% of the carbohydrate produced goes to the fruit, and 50% goes to the plant. So this is why I like to have a large number of functional leaves to fill my fruit, but also it feeds the plant for overwintering. It's, it's, it's actually, <laughs> the reason I say that it does, but it doesn't, is that if that was true, ice wine could never be grown <laughs> because the fruit is still there and all the leaves are gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is no post-harvest, yet the plant continues to thrive. There have been some blocks that have run ice wine five years in a row. Mm -hmm. Most try to do it two years, then a year of normal harvest, two years, then a normal harvest. Because there is, yeah, we expect over time, but it's amazing how the plant is resilient enough. And, and we have had many years, our red Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, frost has come through and taken all the leaves off before we have picked. Yet they come back the following year and everything's fine. So I wouldn't say I do it every year, but 
the plant adapts. There's no new there's no new photosynthesis. I'm going to let Jim talk about it because he worked on that. That the fruit has to be naturally frozen on the vine. Yeah. yeah. And you guys cut some people yeah. here cut it off yeah. and you let it sit in the net. Because we need to. So there are some. Yeah. There are some. There are some. Uh, there is some activity within the cluster after. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no translocation. Okay. The, yeah. Once the the uh, the rachis and the pedicel they harden off. There's not much happening uh, going to the from the plant to the berries, anyways. And so the biggest thing that's happening though, when if the fruit is naturally hanging on the vine, the fruit has a different microclimate yeah. than it would if it was all yeah. in this, what we call the sausage. If it's all if the fruit goes all in the net, and so you have different freeze and thaw cycles. Yeah. And and so that can change the biochemistry of in the in the flavor okay. and everything in the within the berry. Okay. We find some years if it's a really late harvest and a lot of the fruit ends up falling into the nets, that you and Kevin, you'll know this from talking with growers and everything yeah. as well, is that it, 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 even if it's really cold, it's still like mush. Yeah. And it's difficult, it's not the same pressing and you don't get the same yields yeah. and the same quality. In, in that sausage steak. In, if, in if, if you're, yeah, if you're a grower or a winemaker, you prefer to have a lot more clusters hanging on the plant and, and just clip them off as opposed to that big mess of okay. mush yeah, but, but, in your, in your nets. Yep. There was some concern, I know, with our winemakers, the dilemma was they wanted to get frosted leaves off the vine as fast as possible. There is, can you remember what uh, Craig called it? There's a name for it, that, that the leaves may impart the frosted leaf yeah. showing up at the time with the fruit. There's a negative flavor associated with it. So they were actually trying to, as very quickly as possible, harvest the fruit. Because there were, they don't, I can't tell you the, the chemistry behind it. I'm just going from their experience as winemakers. Okay. Yeah. So Andy's been doing some research on this, Andy Reynolds at Covey, and they're, so what's happening is the, the mog materials other than grapes are getting into the red wines and it's like a floral taint. That's and right. they were trying to figure out what it was. It's almost like geranium taint, but it's, anyways, Andy's done some work and it seems to be uh, terpenes from the leaves, uh, like, uh, um, Cicero's oxide, for example, is one, and so it almost sounds like it converts to mean flavor in red wines. Okay. And so they're they're looking at their various terpenes and their ozoprenoids that are causing some of the issues. That's what they that's what that's what they're finding right now. So in terms of you know like the hand, if there was a hand harvest, very shortly after frost is preferred over leaving it for length of time, because of that we just don't know exactly, but there's something that goes on. It was more an issue with reds because they're not naturally occurring flavors. Well, no, we don't generally, well, <laughs> hey, we cheat. Uh, <laughs> often, uh, uh, late harvest is classified by the bricks level. And let's just say some people have taken ice wine grapes, press them, get the bricks level, wait, let the cake warm up, repress it again, which turns out to be a, and voila, late harvest. <laughs> so it's all, it's, it's a matter of there, but it's, it's just certain varieties that there were issues. Uh, but um, we haven't run into it, let's say, with Vidal or Riesling or what other whites. I guess those are the two dominant ones for ice wine. We haven't run into this leaf flavor issue, but on the reds, yes. No, I wouldn't say that that's, the acidity level is within the berry itself and is really not impacted by the leaves at that point. 
because the bulk of your acid is made by the leaves very early in the process and it has a high level and then it's the degradation of the acids within the berries themselves that cause the acids to drop. Why it would increase again, I'm not. That doesn't match the biochemistry or the physiology. They, th they may think so. I'd be surprised, you need temperature to get the enzymatic activity to get it. Mm -hmm. This slide is just talking about shading. And all it's going is that sunlight at 150 units, the second layer, you can lay a leaf literally on top of another leaf and still have enough go through the leaf to make it functional. But if you have a third leaf, a third plate, it's below it. So in other words, it's not working. But that's just at one point in time. Remember, we have the earth is rotating, so these leaves are not always at, in the shade. And what we want is refraction of it. But if they were in a complete, just a straight line down below, and I put three layers, this is what happens. But if I stand here and look this way, part of the leaf isn't in the shade, so it will be active. So it gets, it gets confusing, but it's part to recognize too many leaves on top of one another are not a good thing. These are the different trellises that we've looked at them and trying to decide a forearm and a Scott Henry. The difference being we train the shoots down here and up. On this one, we just let them grow. <laughs> and then we look at fruit exposure. This was done at a friend of mine's that we worked with because he was having trouble getting his reds to color and get good sugar and flavor. And when we went to this canopy, we suddenly got much better fruit by opening it up. More work, but better fruit. I mentioned yesterday about row width to row height. They did studies where they had a row that was six feet high. And the rows were four feet wide. They worked out the effect of sunlight was only four and a half hours, roughly five hours on that canopy. Because of shading from this row to this row, late in the day. When they went to a six foot by six foot, they had seven hours of effective sunlight. When they went to nine feet, they got eight hours, but the productivity on here was too low. More sunlight, but for your land mass, very ineffective. So ideal, one to one get you enough sunlight to keep everything happy without shading. We were running roughly just about seven and a half, about seven feet, seven to seven and a half feet. But the rows were, the rows were eight feet, so they were 2.2 meters wide, and you're running about a 2.1 meter height to the top of the canopy. It just says, leaves at the top of the canopy are able. What you want to do is have lots of leaves in the top. The more leaves you have in the top, the more sunlight you will capture. People were concerned about, in our latitude, about orientation, east-west versus north-south. Definitely here, as well as in Ontario, north-south still is preferred. Sometimes geography won't let you do that, and in that case, if you have to go the other way, you might want to go with slightly wider rows to allow more interception during the ripening period. Uh, temperature, optimum temperatures for the grapevines to grow. That just means when it's running at full, full tilt. Each variety, basically at 11 Celsius or lower, the plant just sits there. When we get excessively high temperatures, the plant will actually stop. It will, it will not stop totally, but it reduces the rate of photosynthesis. Leaf age, mature leaf, roughly 30 to 40 days. They are your friends. <laughs> they are the ones that are going to be the workhorse that will do most of the work for your vine. Very low amount when they're young, a lot of carbon dioxide used. When they're older, much more efficient. 
Older senescent leaves, they're low due to a low nitrogen content in the leaf. There are geriatric leaves, they're the okay. ones that can go to the old folks home. And that's just showing the effect of leaf age. Minerals, pathogen diseases, pollutants, ozone. So remember, your leaves are the workhorses. Having lots of wood is not good. <laughs> Having lots of leaves is always the best thing. All parts of the vine cannot satisfy themselves. The leaves need the roots, the roots need the leaves, the canes need the leaves, the trunk, the fruit, everybody's helping each other. So in the long part and the short part, we have to get enough leaves to get the fruit and enough to get, to get us through the winter. If we don't do that, um, I was asked years ago, can you grow grapes in Alaska? Can you grow grapes in Siberia? Can you grow grapes? I said, I can grow grapes anywhere in the world for one season. <laughs> but the second year might be hard. The berries developed as we talked. High demand of the berry where that peak growth was, where it sits, and then the third part where you get stage three, which is the flavor development. This I stole from California because it's one of these things that explain things to me. The key one to remember was that once we hit Verazon, very little water is going into the berry from the xylem. And it's also the point at which the berry stops photosynthesizing. A green berry up to Verazon is producing its photosynthesizing. But once it hits Verazon, the cuticle gets thicker, your stomates start to, to, to plug, and the xylem, water stops flowing in. And if water stops flowing in, it can't produce carbohydrate, because you need water and sunlight and, and your green material to produce photosynthate or carbohydrate. But this is just going, just to explain, as I said, the, the, the ebb and flow. Well, your impact here is that recognize from fruit set to veraison is when all your acids accumulate within the berries. And then generally what happens, the, the, the reason that your acids change later on is that there's, there's malic acid degradation, but there's not really any new formation. The reduction in acid often when you go later is that the berry is also getting bigger relative to the amount of acid that's within the berry. A lot of it runs right up to Verizon. Jim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the bulk of acid formation is, is during that window. Yes, those, two, those are the two key ones, yep. Right, well, that, but that's coming back to the amount of acid that was initially formed. But the two reasons for lower acids later in the season comes down to degradation by enzymatic activity and precipitation of the the acid out. Jim? Yeah, certain species of grapes have higher levels of acidity. It's, all, it's because of their genetics. And um, they're looking more in the US right now in their, in their hybrid breeding programs. They're looking at the acid formation and what type of acid and what kind of enzymatic activity they have. Some of these uh, wild species actually don't lose acidity which is really weird. Um, and so they're looking at, they want, because one of the biggest problems is the high, um, a lot of the higher uh, acid grapes are, it's a, it's a negative trait for better improved cold tolerance because of uh, vitus riparia and so on in their parentage. And so they're looking at the genetics now of, of the acid formation and degradation um, in, their, in their fruit. But, um, but, so for us in, species but for us to influence it, we really don't alter no, it's the plant's ability genetic. or how much it makes. It's the growing season and the plant response to it. Yeah, but but we the don't temperature can have some impact in terms of acid formation in some years. And it seems counterintuitive, but the same with methoxyperazines. Um, in California, in Merlot in California, they actually start off with higher levels of methoxyperazines than we would have in Merlot in Ontario, which seems really weird. 
but it, they, they produce higher amounts of, of these uh, uh, precursors from methoxyperazines, but the fact is they have great ripening weather, warmer, sunnier conditions, and that breaks down those perazines. So, so does that make sense? <laughs> like there's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of genetics, but the environment does play an impact with, with so certain secondary metabolites. You can. You can start off with yes. higher levels. Okay. More because then that's where the fruit composition, sorry, the fruit exposure plays a big role because then it's the canopy that's important, but then if you have shading in your fruit, that can lead to issues with high acid, high uh, pH because of potassium uh, in the shaded fruit, higher potassium mm -hmm. levels in the fruit. And also the, the fruit, if it's cooler, it's not going, the malic enzyme, for example, isn't going to be as active. And so you can have more malate malic acid in your in your grapes and and that's an example we're, we're seeing this year in ontario we've had cool conditions and our malic acid levels have been very high um so um <laughs> that's a lot i guess the, the, the best way to describe it is higher temperatures and shading lead to higher acid levels all that we're saying is that acidity starts here and goes down over time. But if it is shaded and cool, this level, instead of down this low, may stay up here. So that's what your plant is doing over the year. So when we impact by looking at leaf removal and timing, and exposure, that's what we're trying to get to. A little quick one that just leads into some of Jim's stuff and I'll go, we've just shown, we've, we've done enough work to show that the bigger the, the cane, the more likelihood of damage. And that's what I talked yesterday, if it's a little bit bigger than pencil size is okay, but if it gets cigar size, it's too big. Excessive growth and excessive shading leads to more damage. The, they just don't seem to mature or withstand winter temperatures as well. When you have reserves and fewer buds, then, you, then optimum for balance, you may see some trunk damage because the trunk is not maturing as well. It's got too much. It's got to have a balance. Clumping or shoot congestion, you get too many close together, you wind up getting bullwood development in some spots. One will want to dominate and just grow, but there's lots of support. Cover crops we use to manage vigor. Crop load management, as I talked yesterday, start big and then reduce. Water, if you can, but we can't, so our key there with water management is Keep the plant out of stress. If it's too dry, if you can supplement with water, is always a good thing. Don't over fertilize. Really big green leaves that look really, really good are not good. <laughs> you want leaves that are almost a little pale, light, is better than a dark green leaf because it means it's working at, at proper amounts in the canopy management. Yesterday there was asked about some of the deficiencies and, and issues that, that we were seeing out there. The straw, everyone knows magnesium. Between the veins, it intensifies older leaves. My general rule, MG, geriatric, magnesium. MN, manganese, new leaves. Looks the same. People were asking about uh, bunch stem necrosis. There is some implication with magnesium deficiency, but the giveaway is that the stems will deteriorate. Be sure that you're looking for that. If you just have berries shriveling or drying back and the stem is still solid green, it's not bunch stem necrosis. They have found, David Jordan did work when there was excessive ammonium applied or uh, nitrogen fertilizer close to the bloom period 
that they ran into problems later in the season with bunch stem necrosis. It wasn't so much a, this was, this was the effect. When they were loading ammonium and nitrogen to it, they were getting it later. No one's sure what the trigger is for bunch stem necrosis. It may be a latent infection, it may be, we don't know, it's a physio physiological response. Bunch stem necrosis is not a disease, but it's a disorder. No, ground applications. But they were measuring the amount of nitrogen in the, in the uh, actual clusters at the time. Well, we, to be very honest, we won't use nitrogen within three weeks of bloom. But what's the, a lot of... Nitrogen? Well, they were using, I think he was at one point, he was using up to 40, 40 kilos per hectare of active nitrogen. Now, this was, on, this was on vinifera, on hybrids, 40 kilos is not, <laughs> is not high. On hybrids, it's probably closer to 60 to 70 uh, kilo. But it was just, to, you know, to highlight some of the things that we've, we've seen. Iron deficiency, I doubt you're going to run into this. <laughs> I just grabbed some quick slides where you get the nice bright yellow leaves. Iron deficiency is associated with high pH. I've never run into iron deficiency when you're at below 7.5. Zinc deficiency we've run into periodically and the giveaway for zinc deficiency are leaves that are unbalanced. If you look at it, every leaf is symmetrical, just like a person. Right? One arm, this arm, one leg. But if the leaves suddenly are tilted, and they grow somewhat zigzag, you can, you're, you're into a zinc. And we deal with that as a foliar. Uh, we don't deal with any amendments. And there's the, this side of the blade is not the same shape as the other side of the blade. But you get this discoloration. The other thing is you can get with zinc is you can get shot berries. So people were asking a little bit about millerontage there is some suspicion that it can be nutrient related, but they're not sure which nutrient exactly. Boron's been implicated, zinc has been implicated. We're just not sure. Yes, yeah. No, we haven't found the deficiency in them. That's, that's the, it, this almost is a varietal tendency. Manganese, as I said, the new leaves. And the difference, zinc versus manganese on a new leaf. The zinc is misshapen, whereas manganese won't give you an off-shaped leaf. Boron deficiency, if you truly have it, and the dilemma is that boron deficiency and boron toxicity give you the same symptoms. We have had people applying boron thinking they're deficient, and they're actually adding to the problem. And the giveaway often is, is swellings. You'll find poor, poor fruit set, shot berries. Boron's part of, uh, very integral part of fruit set uh, in terms of pollen tube germination and growth and fertilization. Too much of it, and it seems to mess that up. Toxicity, you'll find speckling along the margins in necrotic areas. You'll find off-shaped fruit. Oop. Well, that's really the one. But those are the key, key parts for boron, and it's worth taking a look at. If you've had issues of repetitive problems with fruit set, do some soil testing within the, beneath the vines, as well as testing uh, some tissue testing. I was mentioning yesterday, the numbers that I use for the, the amounts in soil and that are probably 30% of what other areas use. Because we found, when we went to sites and were using their, their base levels, we were seeing symptoms. We stopped using it and got it down from instead of 0.5 to 0.25, things were balanced. But that's a site by site issue and you have to really look at it. We do bol boron, uh, we do not use any granular boron. We will only use liquid boron, but we apply it to the soil. Because it's the only way to evenly distribute it over a profile. You cannot a recommendation of, of 20 kilos of boron over a hectare of land is next to impossible. That's a salt shaker. <laughs> you can't do it. You can't mix it. I, I've shown people how, so what we've done is use liquid boron because we have weed sprayers or other things. We've actually mixed it in with weed spray 
to apply and we can get exactly what we want and we know because it's in solution. We use one, uh, our recommendation is 1.5 liters of a 10% boron product per acre. So that would roughly be about four liters of 10% boron solution to cover one hectare. We, we just do it underneath the vines, strictly focused underneath the vines. And you will find, if you have a suspicion, it will often take two years for it to show that you've made the change. Because boron mobility in the soil is very low, but in the plant, very high. We have spots, yes, yeah. Our dilemma, what got me to look at boron was, boron levels were low, we didn't know it. A, a consultant came into the area and said, oh, you've got low boron. Well, he kind of came in and then he vanished. So growers started putting boron down and the first two years, things look, started to look better. Well, they kept applying it. And then things looked worse. So they added more. And things looked worse. <laughs> and they added more. And that's how we learned that toxicity and deficiency was the same thing. So that said, no, go check the soil and check the tissue to find out where you are. Enough to cover. If you can, if you could, and I, I talk about it, it's, it's like paint. How many cans of paint do you need to paint this room? Uh -huh. If it takes you four cans of paint, then you spread it out over four cans of paint. Okay. But if you can do it in two cans of paint, spread it over two cans of paint, as long as you can evenly distribute it. Your sprayer, the width, the width and, and the volume, the nozzle, yeah. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll often do that not long after bud break as a single application. Yep. But we'll do that two con if we believe there's a deficiency that we found over two consecutive years. You're better putting on one one year and one the next year than to try and overload it in the first year. You'll get some response the first year, but to build your soil level back up to where you want to be, okay. it often takes two applications. We're generally trying to get to 0.25 to 0.3. Or, or slightly above, but if I get to 0.5, I stop. But again, I look at the site and how the vines are performing. I have some sites that respond very well at 0.3. I have other sites that when I get below 0.4, it's not so good, so we actually add some. When we get, you know, it, it's, everything is, it's, I call it the doctor and the patient. What's good for you may not be good for you. So when you start to look at it, because your soil types can vary, whether it's clay, more clay, more sand, more loam, each one has an alteration in terms of the amount of boron it will hold and release it at the same time. You're talking about PPM. Yes. I can send you, I have actually a copy of the stuff, of the charts that I put together for, I, I know on the one I've got my tissue, but I'll get my soil charts and make sure they get along to Carolyn and I can show you how I, this is what I've developed for Ontario relative to the Northeast US, California, Australia, of how, under our soil types, how it seems to respond. Yes, we have done that. Uh, generally, we've done it as a fall application, first part of September. There has been a positive response on the plant, but it's very short term. We've got one year out of it, and then that's it. The subsequent year after that, like the following spring, yes, things were good, but the year after that, the plant was in problems again. Uh, leaf uptake, there's actually a movement from the leaf into that, the, the, the winter bud, which is the one you want to keep. So you want to get on the leaf, translocate, and have the winter bud accumulate some of that boron. And into the cane itself, it's, it's stored partly in there. It's not so much it's gone back down fully to the roots, but it's actually the bud itself. That's why the foliar application gives us one year, because it's that bud. But the next year, that bud isn't there. <laughs> um, some have done that, but they have to go, generally it's, it's at least 10 days, two weeks before flowering. 
anything closer, once the florets have started to sort of separate, it's too late. They don't get the response. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I can't say why, but 